ready to start the second panel now. Uh, and the first paper is by Bastian Becker from the University of Bremen. The Empire Within, Longitudinal Evidence on the Expansion of Christian Missions in Colonial Africa. Thank you, Jeff, um, for, for organizing this and everybody else who's, of course, involved in the organization. Um, it's really um, a great opportunity for me to, to present um, this work here. I think it's also um, very good um, timing um, to present this right after Jan's uh, great paper, because now we learned sort of about the expansion of colonial empires. And I want to talk about uh, the expansion of uh, the other empire, which is the, uh, the mission empire, the empire of, of Christian missions, especially in uh, colonial Africa. And the let me say a few words about the motivation for this paper. And basically, um, as you all probably know, is that there's a large number of studies or growing number of studies that looks at the long-term effects of Christian missions in colonial Africa. Um, but this literature largely ignores the dynamics of the mission empire, especially um, during the early um, and the height of the colonial um, era. And this, of course, limits our understanding of sort of like the historical dynamics, um, but it also limits our understanding of the long term uh, legacies of, of Christian missions. And the goal of this paper is sort of like to, to fill this, um, this gap. Um, there's also a secondary goal, which is uh, rather <laughs> primitive. Uh, the paper also wants to showcase a new data set on, on Protestant missions, which I hope that um, yeah, many others will find useful um, and to work with um, in the future. So um, before I go into the details of the paper, let me few, say a few words about the existing uh, long-term studies on, on Christian missions. I mean, you're all aware that there's, of course, a huge literature on, on colonial legacies in general, general but more recently, um, also because of new um, data sources, we have seen a literature emerging that studies the long-term effects of, of Christian missions from sort of a quantitative political economy perspective. Um, and of course, this interest in Christian missions comes from the fact that they were engaged in a variety of activities. Um, they, they built churches, but they also built schools and hospitals. So they were social service providers, basically. Um, of course, with the ultimate goal uh, to convert people, uh, not really to provide these basic service, services. So they were rather um, instrumental. Um, but long-term studies show that, that these uh, Christian missions do have effects on contemporary outcomes. For example, as one might expect, we do see that uh, locations that had um, yes or saw the presence of a Christian mission nowadays um, have higher levels of education. Um, people in these locations are often still more healthy. Um, unsurprisingly, you find also more uh, Christians in, in these areas. Um, and um, then there are a variety of other effects, for example, um, yeah, Christian missions also have effects on, on inequality and, and mobility, um, which can be good in terms of like it can actually reduce some kinds of inequality, but it also exacerbates other kinds of inequalities that were often depends on a variety of factors like the denomination of the missions um, or other um, locational factors. Um, there are also a lot of... Um, rather um, negative effects. Um, if, for example, papers showing that Christian missions undermine long-term trust in institutions, but also people um, more generally. It can also lead to, uh, to changing norms and for example, nurture um, anti-gay anti um, norms or attitudes. Um, and then of it's of course uh, relevant for all political scientists here, very relevant work by, by Woodbury on, on the um, democratizing effects um, of Christian missions. But as I said, these, um, these studies really focus on long-term effect, effects and there's very little work on the early dynamics of, of mission empires. And I want to close the, this gap. Um, if I caricature the wider literature a little bit, um, I think missions often play one of two roles in the literature. Either we have this really broad literature on colonialism and its legacies, and their missions are sort of ignored as they basically come within the larger package of colonialism. Um, that, of course, um, 
is a rather um, rough assumption. I mean, as we, for example, know, um, a lot of Christian missions actually were active in um, territories that were later colonized before they were actually colonized, right? So we know that Christian missions often preceded colonization. On the other hand, we have uh, this literature that really closely focuses on the long-term effects of, of Christian missions. And here, um, the effects of missions are often isolated, right? Because we want to get a causal understanding of, of, of missions, effect, missions, effect, missions effects. And so they're sort of like isolated from the larger um, colonial effects. And this is of course also wrong as there was a lot of um, cooperation with colonial powers when it came to um, establishing control over local populations, but also providing um, basic social services. And so, yeah, the, the first objective of this paper is basically to provide a quantitative perspective um, on this early dynamic of, of, of missionary expansion, how it interacted with colonization. And then th the second objective is to more directly show the interaction between state and, and churches in colonial Africa. And the specific um, focus that I put here is um, on the role of national linkages between missions and states. Um, the argument basically here being that states and missions stood in sort of a principal agent relationship where um, where um, um, missions were, of course, the agents um, that, that helped in establishing uh, control over territories and providing services, and uh, states sort of sought to control them. Uh, and this was easier in the case missions and states were linked through their national identity because that nurtured trust and communication and so on. And so, so specifically, um, this paper then tests um, a number of hypotheses that all address the question of how formal colonization affected the expansion of missions in colonial Africa. And the first hypothesis um, argues or uh, posits that the establishment of colonial states increased the rate at which missions entered a territory. Then more specifically with regards to national linkages, I suggest that the rates of national missions increased more than the rate of foreign missions. So missions that came from the colonizers metropole should have in, entered territories in, at an increasingly fast rate after colonization. Then a third, um, I also argue that these national missions acquired access to, to better locations or they um, had an advantage over foreign missions. And finally, there's the hypothesis about religious freedom in the British empire, basically suggesting that we see fewer differences between national and foreign missions uh, in the British empire due to um, yeah, a less restrictive stance um, on missions. And so the data that I use in this paper comes from the World Missionary Atlas. It basically covers um, all larger or all resident stations that were uh, resident stations apologies, that were established between 1792 and 1924. And it provides us with the exact location of those missions. It gives us the date of entry and also the country of origin of the different um, sending societies. Um, and I think this is a very valuable source because if we compare this to other existing sources that are commonly used, um, the, the number of stations that are actually covered um, in this source is much larger than, than what, we found, uh, what we find in, in established uh, sources. And that, I mean, just the quantity, I think, is already an advantage. It just gives us a more complete picture um, of the mission empire. Plus, it provides us with more data on the characteristics of different mission stations, in particular, um, when they entered um, and where they came from. And let me start with a few um, descriptive um, graphs. So basically what you see here is the expansion of the um, mission empire over time. So in the um, early 19th century, of course, there were very few Christian missions active um, on the um, African continent. And I should say, um, of course, that this paper focuses on Protestant missions as that's simply a constraint um, of the data source. But what we then observe, observe over time is that, of course, there's this almost exponential increase of Christian missions um, on the continent. And that is sort of 
in tandem with the colonization of, of different uh, territories. Um, there's a little um, bump here at, after the second dotted line, which, uh, yeah, you can probably identify as the, the, the beginning of the First World War. And this bump comes from the fact that a lot of uh, German missions were expelled um, after World War I, which already sort of attests to this, um, these interactions that we can see between states um, and, and missions. Then um, I think another interesting perspective on this new data is to look at the geographic distribution of different kinds of uh, missions over time. Again, um, when we look at the very early um, period, we see that, um, that uh, Protestant missions were only active in very limited parts of, of Western and, and, and Southern Africa. Um, but then later in the 19th century, century um, missions expanded um, mostly along the coastlines at first, but later on they moved more and more inland. And that of course coincides with um, the product use of, of quinine um, and, and also of course with the scramble for Africa. So um, if we look um, after the Berlin conference, um, so here the, uh, the time uh, 1910, I'm so, <laughs> Two decades after the Berlin Conference, um, we see that missions are widely spread out over the co continent, right? Um, and then this just multiplies more um, within within the next decade. Um, and then, with the exception just um, of the Sahara, um, missions, Protestant missions, can be found almost everywhere. Then, to give you a first descriptive idea of how colonization itself changed the inflow of Protestant missions. On the African continent, um, I show you sort of like this, this pooled sample here, where you basically see um, the the aggregate figures of of mission entries, um, where um, yeah, the, the the year zero basically refers to the year of colonization of each different colonization. So even if they were at different points in in, in time, and what we can see here, of course, is that um, with the colonization of territories the um, inflow of Protestant missions massively increase, increases. Um, and as you can also see, is the, the inflow of both national and foreign missions increases simultaneously, although the inflow of national missions, uh, missions increases much more over the baseline that we observed before, because before colonization, there's actually a very low number of national missions entering um, territories. So then to estimate the exact um, causal effect of colonization um, on the inflow and geographic distribution of, of different um, Protestant missions, um, I use a difference and difference analysis with staggered treatment adoption. So basically we have a sample here that covers 38 colonies and their first um, colonization. I do not consider second colonizations like after the First World War, when um, colonies changed from uh, or changed from yeah being a German possession to being a French or a, a British mandate, um, so I only focus on first colonizations. And overall, um, for our time frame, there are almost five thousand um, observations, um, so colony year observations. And um, yeah, one. Uh, Peculiarity is basically the way I treat South, South Africa. And um, what I do here is I do exclude the Cape Colony, which um, was colonized, of course, before the time frame of the data. But I do include Natal, the Orange Free State, uh, State and Transvaal as um, separate British um, colonizations. Then um, the treatment, of course, here is the formal colonization of a territory. And the outcomes that I'm looking at is, is first the, the number of mission entries that we see per year, and then the locational characteristics of um, the mission stations that are present in any given year. And I do perform a number of robustness checks. Then let me quickly present the results. Um, so basically, um, what, what you see here on the left-hand side are unadjusted um, average treatment effects. So this basically is the effect um, of colonization on the entry rate itself. So on the number of missions entering per year. Um, 
So on the, in, in the very top left, you, you can see that um, there's a point estimate of about 0.4 indicating that colonization increased to an additional, uh, increased the inflow of missions by, by 0.4 missions per year. So there's a, an additional mission entering a territory every two to three um, years. However, I think it's important here to adjust for uh, the different baselines that missions expand from. So we, we have to take into account the um, entry rate that we had um, in the decade before um, colonization. And then one can, of course, use different baselines, but, but that doesn't really change the results here. So I used um, the decade before colonization. Um, and what you see here to get a better substantive idea um, of the importance of the uh, colonization effect, you see here that's on the top right, that the number of missions entering a, a colony after colonization basically increases by um, 200%, so almost uh, triples. So, so that basically confirms the, the first hypothesis that I suggested. And then we look, if we look at hypothesis two, which suggested that there are differential effects between um, national and foreign missions. Um, so this is what you see here um, with the second and third point estimate. We basically see that both missions um, experience a boost in their entry rates with colonization, but there are no um, statistically significant uh, differences between the two kinds um, of missions. That picture changes a little bit if we look at um, the geographic composition um, of um, missions over time. Um, so basically, again, to remind you here, the hypothesis was that um, with colonization, um, national missions gain access to better um, locations and then um, foreign missions. And basically I look at a number of factors that um, either indicate um, the richest importance of locations, the access to transportation networks, but also um, uh, have an effect on living standards. And basically I do not find too many effects, but I do find effects um, on uh, factors that are relevant for um, the religious import of locations. In particular, I do find that after colonization, um, foreign missions do lose ground uh, in areas with high population densities um, and also locations close to, to Muslim centers. And locations that had high population densities and were close to Muslim centers were, of course, very important in terms of like um, conversion goals. and and national mission, uh, excuse me, foreign missions clearly uh, lost out here. Then finally, um, looking at the question of whether there was greater um, religious freedom in the British Empire. I mean, if that was the case, we would expect that uh, national and foreign missions were affected by colonization in the same way in the British Empire, but not in, in other colonies. And that is actually exactly what, what we see. So just if we take a quick look here at the right-hand graph, you can see that the increase in missions in uh, non-British colonies, so the more restrictive colonies, was mainly due to... Um, to national missions, whereas in British colonies, we see a more equal increase. All right, then um, let me quickly conclude. I think there are three important takeaways from this paper. Um, first of all, um, we could see that many missions did in fact enter um, territories before they were formally colonized, but then there are also, there's important evidence of interactions. Um, as colonization greatly increased the pace at which um, missions entered um, territories. I've also shown that national linkages can matter in important ways. So for example, we see that foreign missions lose uh, ground in locations that are religiously important. And we see that in restrictive uh, colonies, national missions start entering at much higher rates uh, than uh, foreign missions. And then finally, I do think that there are a number of implications for long-term studies here. Um, basically, um, what all of this attests to is that there are a number of selections effects with regards to the timing and the geography of missions um, that have to be considered in, in long-term studies. And the, the findings here also suggest that long-term studies ignore a number of um, factors um, that can condition the effect of missions like their national identity um, or the duration um, for which they have 
been active. And I think and I hope these um, factors will be studied more. All right, that's all. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thank you, Bastian. Uh, the second paper is uh, an imperial accident, property rights in the Philippines under US rule, 1902 to 1939. Uh, the authors are Leticia Roy Abad from Hunter College and Noel Maurer from George Washington. Ladies and gentlemen of our late night television audience, uh, we would like to present to you an imperial accident, property rights in the Philippines under US rule, 1902 to 1939. This is joint work with, uh, with Leticia Abad. Hello, everybody. Okay, so we're going to actually just look at um, the adoption of property rights in the Philippines during the early 20th century. And uh, we just trying to solve this puzzle. Why didn't they happen? <laughs> We found to our surprise that property rights under American rule got unambiguously worse over this period. So first, the incidence of squatting goes up from two and a half percent to seven and a half percent. And we want to be clear here. Squatting does not mean that you don't have formal title to your land. It means you tell an official who comes by to ask you that you don't own the land. You don't rent the land. You're not pretending to own the land. You don't have a sharecropping arrangement with anybody on the land. You don't have any kind of obligation to anybody. You're just there growing stuff. Yeah, I think they got it. Uh, so, but we also find that uh, over 80%, please don't say 90%, we round things differently, uh, that the newly settled lands were um, without formal title by the end of this uh, period of time. And by 1936, uh, we, we picked that, our data goes through 39, but that's, the best data we have, we've got about 17% of all occupied lands in the Philippines are actually surveyed and titled. It's 83% of them are not. So why? The quintessential question, why? So we got, be, what? Could, Americans don't care. Like the Americans came in, they just don't care, ah, whatever. Americans didn't care about property rights, which would be <laughs> something amazing to find. It'd be a right. surprise to Senator Rand Paul. Uh, you know. On the other hand, our neighbor in Brooklyn, when their house got raided, they were throwing all sorts of crap over the fence. They have property are. rights of those things. But as an Argentinian, that's my homeland, I came to this country because of secure property rights. My government in Argentina confiscated my savings, my pension. <laughs> so she's still yeah, uh, yeah, have problems. So uh, uh, so apparently, um, uh, the, the other possibility is that the Filipinos didn't care. The United States comes in, passes all these pretty laws. Uh, hires people to force them, but the, the Filipinos just didn't care about property rights. Well, the third explanation could be that the incentives were not there uh, to actually just formal, formally uh, secure this, uh, this property rights. So what we're going to try and do is persuade you over the next um, uh, 19 minutes that the third answer is the correct one, that due to a series of political and geographical constraints, the incentives were set up that even though the Americans cared and the Filipinos wanted formal property rights, they just didn't have the correct incentives to take them up. And the issue is that um, we're just going to make a distinction later that there is a there's a difference in what was happening in different parts of um, the Philippine Islands. So to start, we have to say a little bit about what was there before the Americans got there. Because they once upon a time. <laughs> so, so the Spanish actually arrive and take possession of the Philippines in sixteen in fifteen sixty five. But it's a it's a tropical disease environment. Spaniards don't move there. There's no gold. There's no native civilizations that can be taxed. So it winds up in the possession, essentially being run by the monastical orders of the Catholic Church. So like the, the Dominicans and the, and the Jesuits, um, they, they do most of the administration. They take on large land holdings to themselves, which they then pass on uh, to their heirs. Uh, and they take public offices that they pass on through heredity, which I mean, I'm, I'm Jewish, so I don't know, but I, I'm pretty sure I, that's I, not I'm supposed Catholic, to. I'm uh, Catholic, just... Mistakes were made. Um, mistakes are made. It's the Catholic Church. So the, the, the locals are not particularly happy. So there's a series of revolts under Spanish rule. Um, the only the the only uh, rule that the Spanish crown actually seems to try and enforce at all in that badly is to try and limit settlement and reserve crown lands for themselves and to prevent squatting. They, they don't necessarily do this well, but that's the only law they, they try. There are a few attempts at reform. And in fact, when the Americans arrive, the Philippines are at the tail end of a rebellion against 
friar rule. Yeah, and the Americans kind of were in the neighborhood. This was not intentional. This is like, oh, we're just going to get the Philippines for ourselves. They were just literally in the neighborhood. <laughs> literally in the neighborhood. I, I wish I wish that were an exaggeration, but it is important to our story. The, the Spanish-American War is now fought over the Philippines. It's fought over Cuba. Nobody in the United States is thinking about it. George Dewey is stationed in Hong Kong with six ships, gets this order that says, go to Manila Bay, defeat the Spanish fleet, use utmost endeavors. He picks up a Filipino rebel leader in Hong Kong uh, to, to take back to the Philippines, arrives, defeats the Spanish fleet in a, in a, in a battle that has one American casualty. Of a car attack. <laughs> Um, uh, Spanish just surrender. Uh, he, and, and, then, and this unfortunately triggers an insurgency against American rule because the insurgents are, are brought back <laughs> by the American admiral and then told that they're a possession of the U.S. The politics of this are are, are, comp- are fascinating and I'd love to get into it. But it's just that, you know, now, now we own it, right? What to do with it. And it's something that would surprise no one. All of you. Uh, <laughs> Really, Democrats and Republicans did not know, did not agree on what to do at all. So Democrats want to withdraw immediately. The Republicans who are in power want to make it a possession. Um, the 1900 election is largely fought on this issue. The Democrats do manage to pass laws that essentially prevent Americans from purchasing large land holdings or investing in the island. So the Republicans are denied the creation of a U.S. interest group in retention. And so they decide that they'll engage in this policy of attraction and make the Filipinos want to retain their association. That was a race States. issue just looming there. They, they, also they, surprising for, for the U.S. The, but yeah. de- Democratic opposition yeah. is not necessarily based on principled opposition to colonization. Um, after all, you could just give everyone the vote make them American citizens, but that would lead to large scale melee immigration. So um, one of the one of the reforms that they uh, that the Republicans uh, passed was a property right reform that had three legs, basically. All those prior lands were just repurchased and uh, they were just given to the tenants. They were sold to the tenants. Then the other one is to the creation of a centralized uh, land registry in order to have an orderly uh, account of what was happening in terms of lands. And the third one is what to do with public lands. And they did kind of like a homestead thing. It's, right? it's actually the Homestead Act. I no, mean, they didn't have a new... That wasn't the Homestead Act. It just was part of it, right? That wasn't the Homestead Act. Well, that just, was another thing we didn't do. Yeah. In the Philippines, they do. So basically, if you were a Philippine peasant, you can apply for a homestead, 16 hectares, which is almost exactly 40 acres. Um, the registration or the application is free. You would have to pay if title is approved. Similarly, if you're squatting on land, you can apply for what's called a free patent, which also after a survey party goes in, surveys the boundaries, it gets registered in the Torrens registry. So it's legally unassailable. And then um, you would get title. Uh, homesteads require a fee. Free patents do not. Similarly, if you want to take an old Spanish title and regularize it under the new system, application is free, but you do have to pay a fee if it is approved to actually register the new title. And this is, you know, graphically what happened. On the left-hand side, you see what um, it did, actually. It did. It's not a five-year-old uh, duel there, but very cute. But then on the right-hand side, it's just what the Americans want to do. Like, look, straight lines, right angles. Like, this is orally, right? So this brings us to the possibility that the Filipinos didn't care. The United States makes a lot of effort to establish this new system in the Philippines, as well as the requisite system of land courts, a public lands office, um, the centralized registry, um, the, all, the whole nine yards. So in order to figure out whether or not the Filipinos cared, we constructed a model to tell us what would the world look like if the Filipinos wanted title versus what would the world look like if they didn't want title. And do you know we have a model that we don't have time to show you, but it does have Greek letters for you. So we, we get, are very fluent in Greek letters. We get thrown out of the union if uh, if, if we yeah. didn't. Yeah. The, the model basically generates three fairly intuitive hypotheses. So the first is that if land is scarce, that is to say there's not a lot of vacant land, um, you should get more tightly. If land is scarce, it's more likely that your neighbors are going to encroach on your land. It's more probable that they will, so that you are more likely to want the additional security that formal property rights would give you. And the other one is that if you have the possibility of cultivating things that are actually valuable, so higher commodity prices would indicate that, then you're more likely to title. And then finally, the corollary is... Is that together, you should see more titling and more investment. I want to be clear here. This is not, we're not saying this is causal. In the model, these are kind of the same decision. You invest in physically improving your land and buying machinery at 
plowing and barbed wire and land improvements, and you invest in formal property rights. But if you care, if formal property rights are giving you more security, then greater investment and greater titling should be associated. Okay, I'm going to use the E word. Oh, so, don't, don't, don't. No, do I, have don't to, do I have to, I have to, I have to. It's endogenous, people. It's endogenous. Okay. So we're just going to hide the empirical evidence to show you, uh, you know, about this hypothesis, how they go along. So just to start with a really simple graph here, basically you can show, show that some of the assumptions of the model do hold. You can see that land prices are actually higher, the lower the amount of vacant land there is in a particular jurisdiction, and that this is not capturing something to do with land quality, that there is no association between land rents and agricultural productivity. Now, we have some hypotheses about why this is, uh, but all that matters for us is that these two things are not, are not confounded, that prices are a result of of scarcity and prices change with agricultural prices, but they're not determined by productivity. And now this is all pretty, but you know, just now we have to, you know, we're we're fluent in Greek letters, but now just we have to show you that we're fluent in regressions. Uh, so we just collected a lot of land, a lot of land, oh, no, not oh, land. I felt like, like land. Anyway, <laughs> I think oh, land would have been easier. Uh, so we collected a lot of data uh, in order to test this hypothesis. And this was blood, sweat, paint. and t- yeah, I mean, we went to the Philippines, and it turns out that the Japanese had burned most of the data that we actually cared about. I mean, this is like. It just was painful. It was really painful. So well, we, we managed to get it somehow. Yeah. So so basically what we're just testing right here is what are the determinants of the demand uh, for property rights? And this is demand. And we're very excited about this. Very, very excited. Why are we very excited? We're very excited. <laughs> Why are we very excited? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, ladies yeah. and viewers, we're excited about this because we actually have demand. These are applications for property rights. This is not the number of titles that were actually granted after a bureaucratic process. This is a measure of actual demand. How many people wanted titles? And we have it both by parcel and the number of parcels, and we have it by area. And this is before you had to pay a dime if you were the, the, the entity requesting the property rights. And lo and behold, actually, we find that in areas that were densely populated, which means that land was scarce, then more and more likely to title, to demand a title. And uh, and also in areas that were more valuable things were produced, uh, then we also find more demand for titling. Right. And prices, agricultural prices, since the Philippines are in a tariff union with the United States, are being set by the United States. So these price changes are exogenous, which is which is great. Uh, due to initial population density is, of course, in the exogenous as well to the to the Americans. We also find that our our results seem to hold as well for for investment. So in areas that there were more uh, more titling as a share of all the arable land there, uh, we find that uh, people invested more, but they invested not in things that they can move, like livestock, carabaos in particular. They're very, very cute also. Uh, but oh, just things that had to be like just there in the land. So Filipinos did care, right? And Americans did care. Yes. And... Uh, now, the question is that overall, so that you just don't get lost within our hand-waving thing here, uh, is like, I'm Italian, partly, that's, I cannot talk without my hands. So is that the Filipinos did demand more for uh, formal property rights when the prices were of the things that they produced were favorable and also where land was relatively scarce. Yeah, and I'm, I'm a, I'm a fifth-generation New Yorker, so I talk with my hands, too. It's like we're in danger. You guys are lucky that you're not in the same room right now. <laughs> <laughs> oh. uh, but the, the, the issue is that what we see empirically is that during the period of time of American rule, that we don't see an increase of the share of land that was actually titled. So what is happening here? What's happening is, a, is that you have a disorganized settlement of a frontier. So the first thing is that this is not congruent with your current views of the Philippines, but the scale of Philippine population growth has to be kept in mind. We're talking 15-fold increase. In 1903, when the Americans took it over, the Philippines had the lowest population density in Southeast Asia. In fact, it was lower than the state of Indiana. Not today, the state of Indiana in 1900. And contemporaries were just comparing it to my other homeland, Argentina, they, which we can all agree that we all, we all knew that it was a frontier economy. Exactly. So even contemporaries at the time, as you can see from the quote, they they all noted that there's huge quantities of vacant land up in northern Luzon and some of the peripheral islands like Mindoro in, in Mindanao. These, these are all essentially empty. So just you can see into these maps, they're just showing just one frontier uh, province versus a non-frontier province. 
And as we see in the non-frontier province, and this is uh, Negros Occidental, uh, where there's a lot of large of, uh, sugar cultivation there, so we see that a lot of parts that were basically titled. But what happened in the frontier province? In Davao, there's huge population growth. There's big increases in economic output in Davao, but no one bothers to title. You just you just don't, except for the centralized areas around Davao City, which are highly populated. People just struck out to the frontier as squatters. In essence, it wasn't worth it to them to pay the costs and time and effort. They applied for property rights, but they didn't bother to actually follow through, given that following through would be costly. So the question is, was this destiny? And so we 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 would say no, but property rights were expensive. The insular government could, in theory, have subsidized property rights. But in 1930, the entire Philippines is 169 licensed surveyors and is graduating new ones at a rate of 33 per year. We went back and used data from the Bureau of Lands and estimated that if you wanted to institute a 10-year program to basically title all of the Philippines, that is to say, regularize the irregular Spanish titles and give homestead patents, free patents, and land sales and leases on public lands, you would have had to have hired a minimum of 4,322. You do have to order from the U.S., but you have to entice people to come to the Philippines, right? Wages in the U.S. are already, for surveyors, two and a half times higher in the U.S. than in the Philippines. Lower than I think the gap will be today, but, but still big. And this assumes, as uh, Professor Abad just said, no compensating wage differentials, that you could actually get an American to come to the Philippines for the same wage that you were paying them in the United States. So this would amount to around, and this is a lower bound estimate, a lower bound, this 1.5 GDP uh, percent of GDP for 10 years. Per year. Right, per yeah. year. So, and we think it's a lower bound. You know, if, if you have to entice uh, Americans to come, you have not only give a differential, uh, wage differential, but also amenities out of school for their children. And so we think that it could make as be as much as 5% of GDP. And you would have needed to do outreach programs because the Philippines, you've got a largely illiterate population, you've got massive language differentials, you've got people who aren't necessarily used to to titling. Surveying was difficult and more expensive than in the States because plots were often irregular, particular small Filipino peasant holdings or squatting uh, or uh, or uh, uh, squatter areas. So, so this is a yeah, yeah. Re- outreach program, everything much more expensive than this. Yes, and, and how to pay it, right? So uh, then the Filipino government would have had to raise taxes, but this is, was not under the tax. country that was under tax, right? It's the poorest nation in Southeast Asia. Um, at least by nominal GDP statistics, and, and not by a little. Uh, it's 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 undertaxed. You would have had to quintuple the budget of the Bureau of Lands, but increase overall taxation levels by about 15% minimum. Again, in an economy that's not undertaxed. And so it's it's really hard to imagine that that this would have worked. There's another possibility, of course. That it would be just uh, closing the frontier. That means that you have the Filipino government to enforce property rights. So the squatters had to be evicted, right? And also that would not make you know, the Filipinos <laughs> just very happy and uh, you would end up with another rebellion uh, that did yeah. happen and there was we, no enforcement of property rights. Right. We have no right. historical evidence yeah. that this was at all ever considered. So we have a, there's a few possible places to go from here. I mean, in addition to taking into account all of all the comments here to make the paper better. Um, one, of course, is we're gathering data currently on rural result, revolts. There is an upsurge in rural unrest in the 1930s. It does not seem to be related directly to property rights, but we don't know. The second is we do know that there are places where there was an effort to fully title. Uh, so Japan in, in Korea and Taiwan encounters also an irregular situation and titles everything. And we also do know that the settled areas of the Philippines do fully title. I mean, there is full titling around the area around Manila Bay in places like Negros. Um, and so there are, there are possible venues for future research uh, also to see whether or not there's any long-term effects of this to the post-independence period. But, so um, overall, our conclusions are that um, the Americans did care. So yeah, Americans. Uh, the Filipinos did care, but the problem was uh, the question of incentives. And this is a distinction that we have to keep in mind that 
people acted differently when they were in the frontier uh, province versus a non-frontier province. Okay. And the only thing we want to say is the Americans did not care enough to subsidize this program because obviously the U.S. Congress in theory for what is a trivial amount of money in American terms, have subsidized the program we're talking about. But also, we have zero evidence that Congress even considered it. The feeling was the Philippines get political autonomy in stages. They're fully autonomous by 35, but they start getting it in 07. Uh, there's also a political economy uh, question that we, we just want to say that we're not addressing, but that we'd like to in a future paper. And I think the commentator will have something to say about this, which is that the Philippines does not have universal suffrage. The first elections, the electorate is about 2% of the population. That grows by 35, but there's still a literacy exam. And it is possible the political economy here would have sh shaken out very differently had you had universal suffrage. Uh, and I guess with that. That's all we have for now. Thank we're, you. We're out of time. And we'd like to hand the keys over to uh, to uh, Professor Payne, our, our discussant. All right. Well, thank you, guys. That was that was informative and fun, as, as usual. So we, we do have Jack Payne from the University of Rochester, an uh, undergrad from UVA back in the day. I remember him. Uh, and Professor Payne will be providing comments. Great. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, I enjoyed uh, reading the papers and listening to the presentations. I just got to get my uh, screen shared. I have, a, I have a tough act to follow with Ali's comments, so I'll, I'll see if I can do something that uh, you know lives up at least in part to it. Okay, uh, so I'm going to talk uh, about Letitia uh, and Noel's paper first. Uh, so this one is what we just saw, an imperial accident, property rights in the Philippines under U.S. rule, 1902 to 1939. Uh, to uh, sort of briefly recap some of the highlights of the paper, um, there is a broad consensus in not only political science, but economics as well, that transparent and enforceable uh, formal property rights promote economic growth. Um, and the general assumption uh, is that weak protection of property rights stems from the supply side. So you have corrupt governments or low bureaucratic capacity or, or something in that regard. Um, and so even though they're sort of speaking to this broad question and their answer in a sense is that, yes, property right protections are probably good for economic growth, which is in line with the existing consensus, uh, they actually open up an entirely new avenue here, uh, which is uh, they analyze this question from the demand side. Do people actually want formal property right protection? And surprisingly, they highlight that no, not necessarily. Um, so it really depends on the value of the land. So even when the state provides adequate legal infrastructure for protecting property rights, there is still transaction costs. There are costs of measuring the value of land, buying and filing a formal land title, et cetera. And so if the land isn't valuable, there's going to be low demand for property rights protection, despite, and this is where that there's certain new insight comes in, even in a case where there's relatively high supply uh, of bureaucratic infrastructure in the sense that there are relatively low costs of protecting property rights, yet it still might uh, not uh, be worth it to purchase property rights. Um, and so then they apply uh, this interesting theoretical idea uh, to frontier societies, in particular, uh, the Philippines under U.S. occupation. Um, and so the to provide the, the much briefer uh, version of historical events um, to, uh, to prevent future revolts, uh, the US invested uh, in bureaucratic in infrastructure uh, for registering formal property titles, uh, yet surprisingly uptake among Filipinos was, was relatively low. Um, and so what they show in their main empirical results uh, is that high population, uh, oh, sorry, it's supposed to say high population density there, uh, is uh, positively and significantly, uh, with most specifications, correlated uh, with the number of and the area uh, of titles demanded. Um, and it's important here, as they highlight in the paper, that their measure is based on the applications for titles uh, rather than titles granted. So not only uh, does their theory uh, isolate this idea of the demand for property rights, uh, they're also uh, able to design a statistical test that, that accounts for that as well. Uh, and then finally, uh, they answer this policy counterfactual, which I think is, is hugely important because this sort of speaks to the, you know, what are the policy implications of the question, scaling up the program, things like that. How costly would it have been for the U.S. to pick up the entire tab for issuing formal property titles relative to the Filipino economy? The answer is a lot, as they just said in the presentation, relative to the U.S. economy, uh, quite little. Um, so that's what we have. Uh, so, so now I'll go into a few things that, that I was thinking about when reading the paper. So. Um, the, the table two in the paper, which is the main statistical results, uh, uses uh, two-way fixed effects. 
And that, that's fine, potentially, uh, but I, I wanted to know a little bit more uh, to be convinced that this is the specification that I, that I really wanted to see. So basically, like, without knowing a bit more about variation in the data, which I'll, I'll get into in more depth on the next slide, it's, it's just hard to know whether I actually care about this one or, or the pooled estimate more. Um, so the virtues of two-way fixed effects eximators are uh, well known. Uh, they, they eliminate certain types of biases. Uh, but uh, depending on the structure of the data generating process, it's not actually going to get rid of uh, everything you want. So if effects are uh, heterogeneous or, or nonlinear and uh, the treatment of variable uh, exhibits a larger range across rather than within units, uh, you sort of have these comparisons where you're making them uh, within the units, but you're not actually comparing apples to apples if you don't have the same range of variation uh, within each of uh, the units. This is different uh, than the sort of cheaper criticism, which I'll, I'll still get to uh, in a few slides, uh, that like parallel trends is violated. So just to be clear, this is sort of a, a, a different uh, sort of assumption and um, diff and diff that I'm getting at. And so really what, what I'm, that, that was sort of the abstract way of saying like, how much does population density actually vary within units over time? Because naturally what I'd think um, is that you'd see a lot more variation in population density across provinces than within a province over time, but with the two-way fixed effects, uh, you're effectively uh, looking at that difference uh, within a particular uh, within a particular province. So I, I guess my concern would be uh, that you might actually be throwing out theoretically very or theoretically relevant variation uh, by only looking at uh, the within uh, unit estimate. So uh, th there's a lot of ways to get at this. At minimum, you could, you could present some descriptive statistics. You might even consider uh, presenting the, the pooled estimates or uh, when, ones with only uh, time fixed effects in it, because uh, there, there might be additional theoretically relevant variation there. Of course, once you move to a, a pooled type estimator, then you're dealing with other sources uh, of omitted variable bias. But I, I think given uh, given the there's sort of like no one silver bullet here, uh, sort of uh, probing these assumptions at a bit more depth and, and maybe uh, showing a range of, of estimates might be, might be useful. Um, one, one possible alternative explanation that jumped out at me um, is that it, there actually are reasons to believe that it would be more costly uh, for the people that moved to and actually lived in frontier areas to gain formal titles um, and uh, that this would have the, the sort of effect of, of violating parallel trends. And so specifically what I have in mind here um, is uh, lower educational and, and literacy levels of, of people that were actually choosing to move uh, for the frontier. And so in that sense, it would actually be more and potentially prohibitively costly for them to navigate the system. Um, so it might, as a, like your, your story is about this conscious choice that even though the cost of investing in land title is relatively low, if you're just sort of moving, then you know the the benefit is is really low as well. It it could just be like they didn't know how to use the system. Um, and you, you mentioned uh, somewhere in the paper that like literacy rates uh, across the Philippines. Uh, were relatively low. And so I think to the extent you, you have any uh, data on this in particular within the colony, um, I think that would, would be really useful to bring out to, to either rule out this alternative explanation or, or even just to claim that it's, you know, you, you do think it's, it's going on and it, it's potentially complementary uh, with your story. Um, and so, it, but, you know, depending on what information is available, I'd want to know more about uh, what how many people were migrating to who they were, where they came from, where they went. I mean, it's, I think this is, you know, the whole story is about migration. And I thought the, the historical background generally uh, was fantastic. I actually think it's unfortunate that for journal length purposes, in, in particular in political science, you might actually have to cut that down. So I, re I really like that. I, I felt like I learned a lot. It was very clear and it was relevant for the paper, but I actually want sort of a bit more uh, on, on this on this aspect specifically. This, this comment is kind of an aside, but it, it highlights a different context in which knowledge by the people on the ground sort of impacted how a program works. So in, a, in an entirely different context with the, the warrant chief system uh, that the British installed in Eastern Nigeria uh, between the 1890s and the 1920s, uh, this worked really badly. This is sort of typically characterized as like the emblematic of like despotic colonialism. And it was, it was a horrible system for, for a lot of reasons. Um, but actually one of the reasons in practice it worked so badly uh, was that villagers tended to believe that the warrant chiefs had nearly unlimited legal powers. They didn't. So actually had they taken uh, some of their cases uh, to the colonial courts, 
they, there's a good chance they actually would have won uh, a number of these cases. They didn't know to do it. So that's sort of the, the spirit uh, of what I'm concerned about here uh, with people on the frontier. Did they actually know how to use uh, the, the formal system in place? Um, this is, a, this is a pretty minor comment, and because of the different specifications, I'm, I'm not overly concerned about it, but I'll highlight it, um, that uh, in, your, in your main specifications, uh, your main explanatory variables, population density, which presumably correlates positively with absolute population in an area, and uh, your first dependent variable is the absolute number of titles. Um, so you already show that that's not driving it because your other dependent variable is, is based on area, um, but it, two sort of simple possibilities to consider, either as in the main specification or as robustness checks, uh, looking at the number of titles demanded per capita in an area to, to get at that, or, or just control for absolute population in addition to uh, population density. Uh, because I'm in the Rochester Political Science Department, it's obligatory that I make a comment about a model if there's a model in a paper. Um, so I like it, it's good, it's simple, it clarifies the intuitions. I thought you dedicated just the right amount of space to it, which was not very much, but it was still you know, uh, clear and crisp. The only comment I have here is that I wouldn't advertise it up front. I think it made its way into the abstract and, and certainly in the intro. I think, it, especially if you send it to a political science journal, it's going to affect the referee report and probably not in a way that's positive for the sort of the, the big out value added of this paper. Um, so I, I don't think you really need to, to signpost it, but I also wanna say that this isn't a critique of the model because I really like that there's sort of this big overarching question uh, that uh, your empirics like directly speak to. And that, that's also why I really like the, the counterfactual exercise at the end, because it really uh, helps flesh out the answer uh, to this big question. Uh, and then my last comment here um, is, uh, I, I was thinking about the US in the 19th century, because it's sort of a, an obvious parallel case. So also a frontier to society, uh, we tend to think of the wild west in the US, but like, in a comparative sense, like Western territories in the US in the 19th century had very strong property uh, protection right regimes. And so this paper sort of nicely raises this puzzle of why given low population density. So certainly don't think you have to address it in this paper, uh, but I was really interested in the theoretical theme that you raised here. Um, I hadn't thought of it before and, and I think it sort of opens up uh, some big important questions. Okay, cool. So, um, uh, Bastian's looking at this uh, really important question of imperial expansion, um, sort of premised on this foundational question of how did European uh, powers build their empires? Um, and so one important component of this, uh, as he highlights clearly in the paper, is Christian missions. Uh, and they often, uh, in fact, preceded uh, formal colonization uh, by a European power. And so uh, what factors actually propelled the spread of, of Christian missions? Um, and based on existing research, this is hard to know uh, for, for two reasons that are closely related to each other. So one is that they, they're looking at lists uh, of missions that are incomplete in, in various sense. And the other uh, is that they're often looking at time and variant lists. Um, and so uh, the contribution of this paper uh, is to digitize a map uh, that not only is extensive in its coverage, but both uh, temporally uh, and spatially. And so then uh, in terms of the statistical analysis, uh, the main uh, causal factor he proposes uh, is the onset uh, of formal colonization and the effect of this uh, on missionaries in an area, uh, looking at difference and differences estimates for the onset, uh, for the effect of the onset of formal uh, colonization, as well as examining a uh, heterogeneity uh, by colonizer. Um, so I have, I have a few comments, and I, I think my biggest one sort of gets at the heart of uh, the, the core empirical estimates here. And so the, the takeaway from the following slides is measuring the onset of colonialism is prohibitively difficult. And I, I, think, uh, I think more attention needs to be paid to this. So I'll go through a few examples first, and, and then I'll sort of tell you why I'm telling you about these examples. So my first question is, when was Sierra Leone colonized? Well, one possibility is 1787. Freetown was settled, uh, it was governed uh, at first by a charitable organization uh, from London, uh, bringing over uh, formerly enslaved people. Uh, it was then run by a corporation for a few decades. They went bankrupt. Uh, and in fact, this data is relevant because in, in one of the existing uh, widely used data sets for colonial onset, uh, Lang, Mahoney, uh, 2006, uh, this is the date that they picked, or it, it's their alternate date. Um, alternatively, uh, 1808 is a possibility. This was the establishment of the British Crown Colony uh, at Freetown, and this is the date uh, used in another data set, uh, Olson 2009. 
Alternatively, we could use 1896. This was when British uh, annexed the interior of what became uh, the Sierra uh, Leone Protectorate uh, and did indeed uh, start actually formally administrating it uh, with the creation of this paramount chief system. And the, this is the date used in, in yet another uh, data set. Uh, when was Nigeria colonized? This is this is even more of a mess. So uh, in 1851, uh, the British uh, Navy attacked at Lagos uh, to try to end the slave trade. They deposed a king. This is Olson's state for the onset of British colonialism. Uh, a decade later, British uh, formally annex uh, Lagos and creates uh, a colony and protectorate out of it. In 1884, uh, British uh, established their first protectorate in what later became Southern Nigeria. Uh, their control over it was confirmed at the infamous Berlin Conference the next year, where their control over northern Nigeria was also confirmed. This is the date uh, in a different uh, data set for colonial onset. Uh, in 1900, uh, they created the Oil Rivers Protectorate, which was more uh, directly uh, the, the forebearer uh, to southern Nigeria because it merged some additional territories that were under corporate rule. This is also the same year that Britain declared the Northern Nigeria Protectorate. Uh, and then uh, in the subsequent years, they, they went through the, the process of actually defeating a number of the traditional rulers there, most importantly, the defeat of the Sokoto Caliphate, ending in 1914 when the three distinct colonies were merged into one. And so and then they have one on Cape, but you, you don't have the Cape in your sample, so I'll spare you from that one, but it's, it's in the slides. So the, the takeaway from this uh, is that there's sort of two problems with, with measuring the onset of colonialism. One is that in a particular area, what counts as, as colonialism? So for example, to go back to uh, the Freetown example, was Freetown itself colonized in 1787 or 1808? Was Lagos colonized in 1851 or 1861? Then there's the broader problem highlighted with both uh, Nigeria and Sierra Leone, that different parts of the colony were colonized at different times. And I think that, that the first one, I think, is sort of in principle pretty easily fixable. You, you can more or less just sort of, uh, like I, I like the approach you use in, in the paper of, of yours that you cite where, where you uh, combine these existing data sets. I would also suggest just, as robustness checks using each of the different dates and Olson or and those things uh, separately as, as robustness checks. Um, and, and that can kind of get at this issue of like, you know, when, when is the area formally colonized? Um, but the, the sort of broader problem here is that different parts of colonies in, in many examples were colonized at different periods in time. And this kind of counteracts the main uh, value added of your missionaries data set. Because what's great about your data set is not only is it uh, temporally uh, varying, which is what you mainly highlight in the paper, uh, but you also have this very fine grain spatial information on the location uh, of these missions. But then when it comes to your main explanatory variable, it's at a much higher aggregated level uh, when in reality, that there's sort of a lot of relevant variation there. So for example, um, you know, Christian missions that establish themselves in in Eastern and, and Southern Nigeria, if your date for the onset uh, of colonialism in Nigeria is in the 1850s or 1860s, the part of the country where these missions were being established by any definition hadn't been colonized yet. And um, I, I imagine that could impact the results. So I think at minimum, what I'd like to see is just sort of more robustness checks with regard to different dates of colonization, even if you sort of keep it at the more aggregate level, um, the following, I don't know, it might be kind of like too big an ask for, uh, for just this paper, especially because you've already introduced this other data set. Um, this is a sort of broader uh, complaint of mine, which is that I really think we need a spatially disaggregated data set of colonial onset. I, I've read a lot of these articles that have like these sort of modern country level dates of colonization. And I just, I think in a lot of cases um, that sort of doesn't actually measure what we want. Um, in part due to the conceptual issues with measuring colonial onset, but also just because of uh, broader curiosity and, and the types of questions uh, you could answer, I would really like to see you look at other variables as well, not just sort of focus singularly on, on colonial onset, because there's a lot of other variables of theoretical interest. And I think you can really uh, shine light on this broader question of how were colonies constructed uh, obviously through the lens of, of missions in particular. Um, and there's lots of reasons that uh, Christian missions established themselves where they did, uh, whether it's near major water bodies, uh, relation to historical trade routes, 
usually avoiding historical states, although in cases like Uganda, sort of establishing a position within the historical state, climate terrain that affected not only where sort of white settlers could uh, settle in mass, but, but also Christian missions. And so like, I really think that there's, there's a lot of opportunities in this paper to sort of answer the bigger question uh, of how these colonies were constructed. And by looking at some of these other factors, I, I think you could make a lot of progress on that. Um, and then my final comment is um, you, you clearly engage uh, with the existing literature on Christian missionaries. I mean, you, you cite it on page one, the slides are very like, so I, I, I start, my, my comment here is sort of a bit different. Um, so as you know, because you told us this, uh, existing studies on Christian missions focus on outcomes such as democracy, literacy, and economic development. And the core idea in this paper is that we need a better understanding of the treatment assignment process that undergirds these findings. So this point I think is intuitive and, and compelling, but I think to, to take the next step here with regard to like, what is the new big thing we learn about the literature, you sort of highlight that there's this deficit in existing papers. They sort of don't provide this information into the treatment assignment process that, that you uh, do here. But I think you really need to take the next step and tell us, okay, why might that actually change what we, what we think we know about these outcomes? And so obviously one way to get at this is, you know, actually like, you know, running some regressions uh, that look at these outcomes, which I don't think you need to do given, given the focus of this paper. But I think it, at least in the conclusion, I, I think you need to do a bit more to signpost to us, like, what do we think we might learn about these other things? So for example, like I've thought a lot about this issue because I, I have a working paper on uh, the establishment of colonial borders in Africa. And so originally we thought this was gonna be a paper where we looked at the relationship between borders and conflict. And then we found out that there was so much richness in like how these borders were created that we're writing a paper entirely on that. It's sort of similar to this paper in the sense that we're only looking at the historical treatment assignment process. But what we really tried to do in this paper is make people care about that in its own right and also to tell them that everything we think we know about how they created borders in Africa is completely wrong. And here's why that might impact some of these studies. Um, and I think taking a, a bit more of that approach uh, without having to sort of make this a paper that's not about the thing you want it to be about, I think that can really help to, to push the, the broader implications here. All right, excellent, Jack. Thanks very much. Uh, I want to give the, the authors a chance to respond. So uh, Leticia and, and, and Noel, you want to go first here? Sure. So first, uh, we, we really want to thank you for the, uh, for, the, for, the, for the comments. They're really useful, particularly the strategic comments about where we should put the model and how much emphasis we should put on it. Yeah, so no, and and your recap of our paper made it much better. Uh, that was, we thought it was. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we have um, a couple of things. So I think your comments were great. So uh, yes, and you. they're just you know they're feasible. The the dice was like yeah, so, I, I was going for that. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's like you know when you do historical stuff, it's like what? Is Find an instrument. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, download your data.com. Invent your own colony. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, so so thank you. So uh, in terms of you know provincial fixed effects and that I think that that is useful. So what we will have to do is just add a bunch of provincial controls in order yeah. to you know, take that uh, to take that yeah. into account. Which that, are which know. are not all time variant. That's yeah, part of the, exactly. part of the problem. Is, um, yeah. Yeah. We so, got I mean we got a boatload from the American data, but yeah. But yeah. Um, you know, PIMDA's work gave us some rainfall, rainfall data. data. That uh, we don't know how good that, it yeah, that it we is. have to um, figure out whether we can just geolocate it so they'll have enough variation. So, but that that is totally doable. The other thing about migration is something that I always struggle about. Like, do people, can people move because they make choices? And then at the end of the day, I'm not measuring people's behavior. I'm measuring just people that left behind, that were, you know, that didn't have choices. So we had to figure out, I'm not really sure that in the sense that they have data on the share of the people that actually were born in that province. You do from in and out. Uh, but that's because Mindanao, yeah. Mindanao is a yeah. special case because of the Christian Muslim divide. Yeah. So you can yeah. you can get religious data, which the census collected, and, yeah. and get back so, out migration from that. It's harder for other provinces. And the, the problem is that we only have for the census, so we have to interpolate, which actually would not give us much variation, you know, over time. Yeah. So there's that. Uh, but we'll we'll look into migration and uh, to see. Just to, uh, just to be sure, though, we think. That I mean, it's a great it's a great suggestion. We think it biases that not taking that into account biases against our hypothesis okay. because 
non-monetary costs are still costs, and it would potentially even increase the price or the cost of of an outreach program if the Philippine government wanted to to undertake one. So we're gonna we're gonna do our best to try and fill it. Yeah. Sadly, the, all the microdata was lost in World War II. Um, but um, but I, I mean, if we understand correctly, we think it's it's uh, sort of the bias is running yeah. in the quote good direction. Just to make sure that we we understand that properly. Yeah. And then the other thing we have there is, uh, yeah, so the other thing is about, you know, putting population on, you know, the right-hand side and all that stuff. Um, yeah, we'll just do robustness yeah, checks with that. Uh, that is totally doable and, you know, worth doing. So absolutely, well, thank you for that. Over to, over to Bastian. Yeah, I um, can also, also only agree that uh, those were great comments. Thank you, Jack. Also, I think, um, yeah, some very, very doable. So, so let me just say two things that I think I w should and will definitely do. So I think you're absolutely right about the, the colonization date. And, and uh, it's nice that you saw I have this other data set where I've been yeah. struggling with that. Yeah. And um, I can basically just like look at like other alternative plausible dates and see how that affects the results. So I think that's a, that's a really great suggestion. Thank you for that. And, and also just discussing the implications, being a bit more straightforward about this for these long-term studies, I think is a, is, is a great point. So I will definitely do that. Um, I mean, two two things which I think I cannot do in this paper, which is the the I think you're very right about um, basically. There's a lot of potentially potential to more disentangling colonization geographically, um, but that requires another huge effort to actually collect new data on on how yeah colonial. Um, state control um, expanded over that period. And it's definitely something that we need. Um, I mean, the only thing I can say in, in my defense, I, I, I'm actually really optimistic that would only strengthen the results because, I mean, as you indicated uh, from the, uh, the cases that you suggested, I mean, of course, colonial um, state control expanded from uh, the coastlines to the interior. And that's, that's very similar to the expansion uh, of, of the, the, the mission empire. So my, my expectation there would be that that very much moves in tandem that we just observe similar effects. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's that's. But it would be great to to actually look at it um, and, and and figure this out. And, and then on the the, the so other, just to, yeah. just to pause sure. for a second, I, I think that would be great to to point out because that, that's sort of a way to to highlight like, look, there's this sort of massive other data effort you need to do, which is just sort of infeasible for this paper. But actually, there's strong reason to believe that given at least the the colonies on the coast, they in fact started on the coast and then sort of crept inward, and that's sort of more or less the movement you see over time among missions. I think that would be useful to highlight because that, that sort of helps to mitigate that, that problem. Okay, yeah, that's great, definitely doable, thanks. Yeah, and then on the other explanatory factors, yeah, I think there are potentially other things to look into that are interesting. A lot of the geographic factors, I think, are actually addressed in, in the this paper by Chet Wab and uh, co-authors, right? Okay, where they dig yeah. into a lot of questions about like the endogeneity uh, due to okay, causal yeah. uh, geographic factors. So I think they they covered that, but but of course there's more uh, other stuff to explore and yeah. uh, might might be something to look into the into the future. So uh, thanks a lot. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, any uh, questions from the group? Any questions for the authors? Fernando. Hi, yes, just a small question, a brief question to Leticia. Uh, Noel, about related to geographical scope of their study, is there any difference in heterogeneity across frontiers um, uh, in land titling? I mean, you previously mentioned Minan Minandao. I would expect to see that Muslims would resist more land titling in Malina compared to Christians in the north. So, yeah, just a brief if you have something to say about that. Thank you. So, I don't think on top of my head there is a, such a Dramatic difference, right? No, I mean, if anything, in Mindanao it was like slightly higher, partially because of the of the fact that you did have colonists who were crossing um, sea to settle in in Mindanao, which might get a little bit to uh, to Professor Payne's hypothesis that there was selection that was different from settling a frontier, kind of striking out for the frontier near where you lived, versus actually crossing a sea to settle in, in Mindanao. We're thinking a little bit about this in terms of violent incidents, because um, as you know, in the long term, this movement of Christians into Mindanao is going to pour fuel 
on the fire of an insurgency that's going to last for decades in a post-war period. But we didn't see anything particularly there pre-war and the Ambi. We just look at the maps, right? So yeah. one by one. I mean, I, I don't want to get too yeah. much into it because the politics of Mindanao are, are fascinating. I mean, Americans talk for a while. There's a lot of thought about separating it from the rest of the Philippines. And it's very much uh, not happening because the Americans want to give autonomy to the Filipinos. And that's when um, Mindanao also becomes open to settlement by Catholics from the north. Also, there are there are violent incidents that insurgency in Mindanao lasts longer. By the time the rest of the Filipino Philippines has become quiet, you still have violence in Mindanao lasting all the way up until about 19, 1912, 1913 are the last serious um, incidents. So it's pushed back. I mean, the short answer is we could say province fixed effects soaks all this up, but but um, we. Um, we don't have we don't have a good answer. This is me saying like every, we don't have a good answer. Every time, except I, say, to know, every time I said that fixed and fence was something, I was because I'm cheating, right? Uh, so <laughs> so like, but, it's like, but it's just it qualitatively, is like qualitatively, yeah. if anything, Mindanao is yeah. working. There's more titling than you would have expected, um, given given just the fact that it is a wide open, underpopulated frontier. But that's a product of selection bias. And other than that, all I have is babble for you. But I think it's a fascinating question and something that we should definitely dig dig, dig deeper into. Yeah. Uh, Ellie Saron. Yeah, so I have questions for both, uh, both or all three authors. Um, so I'm just going to give them both, and then you guys can figure out what you want to answer. Um, so Tiziana, no, you're a riot. I wish this conference had drinks. Um, <laughs> but I was <laughs> back to your political uh, suffrage um, issue. Um, I don't know. I might rethink this because uh, Horacio Largue uh, and co-authors have a really interesting land titling property rights story in Mexico, where it's a similar situation where, you know, squatters had partial rights, but then, you know, the addition and the endogenous choice of giving, you know, more extensive property rights. Um, and it was almost all political. And the thing is that you actually, because Philippines, the, you know, they started elections. I think I was Wikipediaing this while you guys were talking um, around that time, but even if it wasn't, even if you didn't have full suffrage, there's a good chance that there would be some sort of credit claiming or some sort of political story that would affect, you know, either the titling or something like that. And so, I don't know. I might, I might, I might look at that again because I don't think you need full suffrage to have a political dynamic uh, to the story. Um, and then, um, Bastian, I would uh, second all of Jack's comments, um, kind of on the method. Um, and in particular, kind of the variation in treatments. So what's interesting is that you are, this is a great example of kind of variation in kind of treatment intensity, right? Because each of these is going to be a different kind of uh, missionary experience. And so, you know, you would already get this with staggered treatment timing, which some of, you know, Callaway and Santa Ana can help you address. But from a substantive perspective, also, you know, each of these is going to be a very different treatment kind of across the units. And so... Um, that is going to be low hanging fruit for reviewers. And so you're more than welcome to tell me how you've thought about it, but just FYI, your specific historical case is actually a really good example of variation in treatment. Um, and then uh, I wanna know what your paper, so have you seen Dean Dulé's new paper? Um, it's like the, the search for, it's like spices and souls. It's an amazing title. But he has this, you know, kind of amazing, like the missions were state building, right? So like state capacity. And I think it's Catholic missions, although I've now forgotten. Um, I just saw the paper kind of on Twitter. Um, but this is interesting. And this also kind of goes back to Jack's comments. Like there are, there's a lot of, kind of interesting stuff you can do with this new data. Um, and, you know, to speak to kind of existing studies. And in particular, I think you're gonna have to do that regardless, because if we see different effects with your data, like is it the data or is it something substantive, right? So it's always good to kind of, especially since you're expanding the world, like to, to speak more. Um, but I was wondering what you thought about the Dean Dulé paper and do you think the Protestant missions are uh, state building? Ashton, you want to take that first? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Ali. Um, yeah, for, yeah, I mean, like, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, of course, there's not only, there's not only variation in treatment adoption, right? There's also differences in the treatment intensity. And I think that even like your point probably goes beyond just like the, the question about the geographic extent of the different, uh, so like colonial states and, and the amount of control they had, but also the intensity of control they had over the whatever territories they had. And um, um, 
Yeah, I mean, like, I don't have a good answer of how I can actually address that. And so if you have a suggestion, I'm, I, I would be more than happy happy to hear it. It's a, it's, it's, it's a really tough one. And, and so uh, right now, yeah, I mean, I, can, I basically look at averages, right? And it's, uh, I, I know it's a bad excuse, but I don't know a good way forward on this. Apart from, yeah, what Jack already suggested to look at the, 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 the geographic expense, I think that would be the, the easiest way to, to, to get at this, um, but already a very tough one. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's funny that you ask about Dean's paper. It's also, I mean, some Catholic missions in the Philippines, right? And I actually study much more. I'm also studying much more the, the long-term effects of, 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 of missions or getting into that. So this is sort of like a, a side project. Um, I mean, this paper is a side project of the more long-term studies that I do. And I do have a paper with Dean actually on that, where we look at the economic and political legacy of um, Protestant missions and um but we can basically show that, yeah, these national linkages did have long-term effects in terms of that they promoted more uh, educational development um, and more democratic attitudes. Um, yeah, but it's, that's for another occasion. So uh, his work is great and uh, I'm ready to take it all completely on board <laughs> in this. Thanks. Uh, Leticia and Noel, any last thoughts? Well, we're very interested in, in any, any potential follow-on that could, could that that could go deeper into the political dynamics of of the situation and of what was happening in the Philippines. Um, we tried to find data on 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 elections, so elections, elections just, at the provincial and level. And it was it was um, it was going to the dentist and without just you know getting your teeth so, fixed. Right. We, uh, so, yeah. a, a lot a lot of elections are also yeah. held at at yeah. large, which was yeah. another another yeah. problem. Um, you also you had a long period of one party dominance where the the Nacionalista Party essentially dominates all electoral offices across the Philippines. So the other question is, what hypotheses are there? What exactly are we are we looking for? What hypotheses are we testing? We um, we we did, can't run a national counterfactual about would the would the insular government had there been greater suffrage changed its policies and be more willing to subsidize tightly? We can look at. It's going to be a nightmare, but it's doable, um, and it, it will be fun. Um, outcomes across provinces, but we need to we would need to figure out really like what is it exactly that we're looking for? What are the hypotheses specifically that we want to test? Okay. Any last questions? We're a couple minutes beyond time, uh, so why don't we call panel two uh, a wrap, uh, and we'll reconvene in eleven minutes at noon my time, noon Pacific time for the final, the third and final panel. Uh, and thanks again, this was a great, great panel. Thanks to, to Jack Payne for terrific comments. Uh, fantastic. All right, see you in now 10 minutes.